Lakeland Public Television presents Currents with host Ray Gildow. Sponsored by Nisswa Tax Service, offering tax preparation for individuals and businesses across from the City Hall in Nisswa and on the web at nisswatax.com. Hello everyone. Welcome to Lakeland Currents, where tonight we're going to be talking about something that affects you and me and all of us. Pain. Uh, we've all experienced it at some stage in our life, some more extreme and some not as extreme. But uh, I've never, in the 10 years that we've had our program, I've never had a, a doctor on who is a pain specialist. And my doctor friend today is a fisherman too, so he can't be a bad guy. He's got to be a pretty good guy. Uh, Josh Horowitz is a pain specialist and anesthesiologist, anesthesiologist from the Cuyuna Regional Medical Center in Crosby. Welcome to the show and Thank welcome you, to Minnesota. Thank you, sir. And uh, before we get into the, to the pain issue, which is a very large issue, I understand, but tell us a little bit about your background, where sure. you're from and <clears throat> what you do. Uh, well, I've had kind of a diverse background. I grew up primarily out west in Idaho, Wyoming, in the Washington State area, in the Pacific Northwest. I couldn't really figure out what I wanted to do in my younger years, so um, I tried several other careers. I was a professional pilot for some time. and Really? A um, commercial airline? Commercial pilot, and then I used to build houses for a living, and then somehow I got a wild idea that medicine was the next step in life, and so that kind of led me down a longer path, and I ended up, ultimately ended up here. Um, after finishing training from the East Coast and in, down in the South in Tennessee, and so my folks live local in the area here, even though I didn't grow up here. <clears throat> so I, well, it was important to me to be close to family. And so here I am now. You have a, that's a very interesting background. I don't think I've ever run across a doctor who's been a commercial airline pilot. That's, that's a first. Um, it prepared you well for pain because you had passions, I'm sure. Well, you know, it actually <laughs> was, I sort of serendipitously ended up in pain management. It sort of directed me towards the anesthesia because of the strong corollary between flying in the skill set and the enjoyment of flying, which parallels very well to anesthesia. Um, and there's a lot of literature on that, and there's a lot of resource management and things mm. that comes from the airline industry and the professional flying world that we apply to medicine now, and it was a nice segue for me. Uh, I've been flying long before I ever went into medicine. And so that led me to anesthesiology. And then from anesthesia, I became interested in pain management as a subspecialty and went down a slightly different path from some of my other colleagues that either just stayed in anesthesiology in the operating room or did another subspecialty from that. But and as I understand it, you're the only one in our immediate region. I know there's some in St. Cloud, but not in the immediate region. You know, in the immediate area, so I work for Cuyuna Regional Medical Center, so in the um, Cuyuna area, in the Crosby area, we're the only one, and we're the only one that's really locally owned and based. There are some other practices in the area that have um, remote clinic sites up here, but they're sort of based elsewhere down in St. Cloud. And so we're really the only one that kind of keeps everything <clears throat> here close to home and where people don't have to have quite a drive to get to some of those services. Outside of the fact that your family lives here, which is very important and I understand that, but what, what else attracted you to this area? Oh, well, that's, that's easy. I'm a big outdoors guy. You know, we, we talked about fishing briefly. Um, I grew up on a ranch out west and so the outdoors have always been a big part of who I am and it was important to me to be in an area that really fit my personality and I'm not a big city guy although I've spent a good portion of my life in large cities just by design having to go through my education process but I always knew it would be a small town for me in the end I like the personal feeling of that I like to know everybody in town I like waving at people when I drive by and so I had lived in the Dakotas before, I'd lived in the Midwest, and it just was more fitting for me ending up in the Midwest with the, the values and the personal touch of people in the Midwest. I love the West Coast and it's a beautiful area and I always go back to visit and to fish and to, to hunt, but this was very fitting for me. And so when my parents ended up in this area, which I think had a large degree to do with the fact that they knew I would end up out mm. here, it was just a good fit. I was just going with my instinct and everything felt right. And so far? So far, I Not couldn't be happier. Oh, good. No, I, having been in very big cities and moved around a lot last 10 plus years with the medical training, it's refreshing to be in a small town. So, Well, welcome to the it. area. Oh, well, thank you very much. You'll have to share with me some of the fishing secrets around here. <laughs> Not, 
I have a relative who works in the in, in the insurance industry in the sense that he has to help identify people who are in pain. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he said, I'm glad to hear you're having a show coming on because he said, for us, this is one of the most difficult things to analyze, really how seriously is the pain of this person because people have real severe pain issues and then maybe there are people who take advantage of the system sometimes in the insurance industry I'm talking about here and maybe their pain isn't as severe as they would like to have you think. It's, that's a tough area to analyze, isn't it? It's very tough and it's a subjective experience for everybody and so we, we have to quantify it in certain ways and put it on paper to help people understand like your friend in that industry and in the medical industry we try to put it in a, in an expressible terminology that can be translated from person to person but what we have to remember is that pain is a very subjective experience to each person and there's multiple levels of involvement whether it's an emotional context or uh, a memory context or a physical context it's there's lots of um, there's lots of avenues that impact somebody's experience of pain and so you may experience some version of pain in your life just as I may uh, but they'll be very different experiences and so that's the humanistic part of medicine that's very hard to put a test on and know what it is but that's really what we it's a huge burden on mm -hmm. the society in the United States mm -hmm. so in your practice uh, are you the first person that people come to or do you get referred from their family doctors? Good question. Like? Uh, we do both. Um, it works. It works both ways, really. Um, I would say probably over fifty percent or more is referrals, and that is just by nature of the health system we have, where most people are connected with a family physician or a family provider that manages their overall care. And as a common example, if somebody is experiencing back pain, they may usually will seek help from their family provider before they're sent to a back pain specialist because the common things being common, a lot of those common pain syndromes can be treated conservatively. And when I think it gets out of the normal scope of a, of a family provider or an internal medicine provider, some, anybody, whether it be a chiropractor, then um, when an extra additional skill set is required, then they would come to me. But we see a lot of people that just you know, can self-refer to us. Um, we do look over those and try to see if perhaps they may if they to not waste their time if they would be better off seeing someone else before they see me but um, we we do it both ways so <clears throat> can you take pain and put it into a little boxes um, maybe their their whole area of headaches um, back pains uh, leg pains can you can you generalize like that before you hone in on specifics or you know, how do you approach that that's a good question uh, we do you know there are categories of pain and when we break the pain process down physiologically and pathologically we know that pain is transmitted by different mechanisms and so there's there's pain that's caused from an injury called nociceptive pain. There's pain that's caused from nerve damage or nerve dysfunction. We call that neuropathic pain. Uh, there's pain that comes from an emotional experience. We know that very well and we've mapped that out and documented and that's a sort of a, for lack of better terms, a psychological component to pain and those are all interacting on the same level. So not one is distinct um, and excludes the others. There can be overlap from all of those but we do try to and the reason is and it's a good question because you have to identify what you're treating and sometimes it's very difficult because there can be multiple things in the picture but if we can identify what it is and what the cause is or the mechanism then that gives us the best ability to find a treatment that will work for that person otherwise we're just kind of flying blind mm -hmm. and we're trying whatever we may have to offer that person but yeah. it can be very difficult sometimes because it's not straightforward in, in the area of research, are, are we making progress in understanding pain? We are. There, um, yes, there's a lot of research that, fortunately, in this country, you know, we put a lot of effort and monetary support into studying what we do and making sure that what we're doing is beneficial to people and is not harmful. And so we have the benefit, sometimes it's hindsight benefit because we look back over the years and look at what we have done and ask the question you know what we have been doing is this beneficial <clears throat> sometimes we have to be humbled and we change our direction on things um, but in the world of pain I think large areas of research now are going into the genetics of pain 
looking at predispositions to certain painful syndromes. Um, and then we're getting a lot of evidence in the complementary aspects of treatments with regards to mindfulness training and with regards to the impact of treating the mind and the correlation that that has on the pain pathways, which is applies to that subjective, the subjective experience. We all want a quick fix, you know, mm -hmm. that's kind of the world we live in. Right. Sometimes mm -hmm. there is one, um, sometimes it's easily identifiable. Oftentimes, when you approach the mind, and you, if you think of pain as an experience, if we didn't have the consciousness of knowing we were in pain, pain is an electrical signal that comes to our brain, it gets processed, and we experience that as pain. So this huge connection between the mind and pain can't be ignored, and there's a lot of research that's going on with that. I, I'm looking at the work that they're doing, reattaching hands. Right. Or they're doing things now with the brain to make artificial parts move. And I'm thinking, wow, if we can do that, why can't we figure out a way to stop that, <laughs> that pain that's coming from your back? <clears throat> well, we, you know, <sighs> to, to address the neurophysiologic component like you're talking about, you know, we do, we have modalities. Um, we use electricity, for lack of better terms, to short circuit the pathway. Um, there's, it's called, there's neuromodulation therapies where we interrupt the pain signal, whether it be at the level of the spinal cord or deep brain stimulation. We do it for uh, movement disorders, Parkinsonism, which is really a, uh, a disease of a malfunction of the circuitry in the brain. And it's really all boils down to, and not to, um, discount the complexity of it, but the brain is a magnificently beautiful electrical circuit. And we have found ways to interrupt that circuitry. And so we attach limbs, we place devices to interrupt the elect electrical signal and modify that signal. And we're very successful with that. Back to your original thought, the complexity of all this is what makes it difficult. If it were one isolated lesion, then it's, we have something to go after. But we're proving to ourselves that the brain is adaptable, it's malleable, and it is very complex. And we just, we're working, but we haven't figured it out yet. Well, I'm, I'm assuming you don't do surgery. That's, you're, you're not a I'm not a neurosurgeon, right. no. Uh, we do minor operations. I mentioned the, the spinal, the neuromodulation, and the lay term for that is spinal cord stimulation. And so it's a minor operation where if somebody were to be found to receive benefit from a device like that, it's like a pacemaker battery that gets implanted. So these are day surgeries that the patient goes home. But we have to be very careful about who we identify as patients for these devices and make sure that when we, that we're practicing good medicine, that we um, go over the risks and the benefits and that we identify people in everything we do in medicine who we feel truly will benefit from this, mm -hmm. not just um, as a, as kind of the next thing to try and throw to the wind. But, you know, I always try to, there's this, thing out there called the mom test and it wasn't a, it wasn't a term coined by me but I think medicine really needs to be directed in such a way that you would do something to, to your patient the same as you would do to your family member and not everything works certainly not but do it in such a way that you think that there's a fairly reasonable chance that at least there's some possible benefit there and so so if you have a patient and you've reached the point where you don't really know what to do the next level would be then a neurosurgeon? Is that where you would well, usually that, direct you know, them? That really depends. Um, so it's important to identify when you just don't know something or when you think you need help. And sometimes that's very early on. Uh, and that's frustrating for me and it's frustrating for patients when you come to a specialist and the specialist says, I just don't know. Um, you know, there's no merit to, I think, wasting anybody's time or trying to fool them into into something that may not be of benefit. But it depends on the person. That person may need a neurosurgical or an orthopedic spine evaluation from a surgeon, as an example. If they have some pathology in their back or in a nerve that I can't remedy myself, they may need help from a mindfulness standpoint. They may need learn to learn relaxa relaxation techniques. They may need to learn to separate the emotional component from something that they're dealing with every day. They may need physical therapy and to restructure the body and the musculoskeletal system. You know, we're we're a structural being and we're we're built um, like the 
frame of a car, but we're not built to last forever. So we break down and we wear out and parts have to be replaced. So it really takes a discussion and um, an analysis of what's going on to see where do we go next. Not everybody needs surgery. Not everybody will benefit f from surgery mm -hmm. and it takes uh, the right person to evaluate them. You talk about mindfulness. Do you, uh, are you a person that uses yoga or uh, acupuncture or those I, kinds of things? I don't have any training in that myself. But I mean, would you Absolutely. refer there patients is, to that? Back to the question you had on evidence and research, there's a lot of research right now that's going into complementary therapies. And acupuncture is a great one because we have a lot of data on acupuncture. And the benefit from acupuncture for certain things is as good or better than what we do with modern medicine. And so hmm. um, well, the struggle is sometimes is paying for some of these complementary therapies that they're not often reimbursed in our society yet. But the benefit is there. And so yoga has wonderful data to support the effect of impact on chronic back pain, for example. And acupuncture has very, very good data. Um, hmm. And so it's sometimes hard, though, in our society to open our mind to those types of things. Those are not They've usually... They've been around forever, but... They have, and they're not yeah. quick fixes. You right. know? And we're much more in tune to the drive-up window, and we want something that we can get and walk away with that day. I, I fall victim to that, too. You know, we're, uh, we're rushed in society these days. Right, yeah. So... It's really... It's really interesting, but do you think, uh, I know this isn't necessarily your field, but are we making progress on Parkinson's at all? That's a great question that I, I would say my experience of that is referenced from being an anesthesiologist and training in a large center where we did a lot of Parkinson-related treatments. Hmm. And I, my angle of viewing this <clears throat> is from the movement disorder side of implantable therapies, and we've come a long ways. We do deep brain stimulation as an example for these movement disorders, Parkinson being one of them. And so I would say over the period of time that we've treated this disease, we've come a long ways, but there's, I think that's still a disease that requires a lot of funding and a lot of investigation, and I, I'm not a Parkinson expert by mm -hmm. any means. Um, but it's a very challenging disease to treat. And it's rapidly growing, I mean, with men, and not that women can't get it, but it's just a it is. frightening it, trend. And it always makes us beg the question of, you know, is the incidence of the disease increasing or are we just being better attuned to detecting it and we're becoming more diligent? Um, I know I've had patients recently who I've sent just because I've had a small concern because I know in catching a lot of these diseases early is very important. And so our thresholds for evaluation for these things and our knowledge of how to detect them is becoming further, we're becoming more sensitive to it. So that could be why it's becoming mm -hmm. more prevalent in our society. But um, so in your new practice, and, and, and I don't know, how long have you been here? Oh boy, uh, not quite, th we're just getting up on three months now from oh, the time so we actually opened the is, doors. This maybe isn't a good question, but um, would you typically, a person in your position, would you see more people because of the age of them or because they've been in accidents or, or is it just right. a wide mixture of everything? Um, it can be either one, I would say. Um, because of our location and where we are and our lack of access to certain other specialists such as spine surgeons, I tend to see a lot of back pain, which um, is good, I think, because of all the painful syndromes. Back pain tends to be, when we were talking about what, what is straightforward, what is not, nothing in the body is ever really straightforward, but when it comes to back pain, we tend to fall under the spectrum of more more treatable things that we have a lot of evidence for and a lot of tools in our tool bag. Um, so I see, I see a lot of back pain. I see a lot of the back pain may be related to motor vehicle accidents. People have injuries, you know, they're out working, um, whether they get injured on the job or they get injured during recreation or they just happen to move wrong. We just tend, as we age, to not be as flexible and malleable as we were when we were younger. Um, I see a lot of kind of, I call it birthday related changes of the spine where just the more birthdays we have, mm -hmm. we kind of wear down and we have arthritic pain. And the, the good news about that is that falls into that nociceptive pain pattern. That's kind of a arthritis related specific mechanism of pain and that tends to be respond very well to therapy. So we have great results from that. I'll give you a counter example where 
people get pinched nerves, we herniate a disc or we pinch a nerve, and those sometimes will respond to conservative therapies, certain injections. And if not, then those are the people that sometimes have to be evaluated by my colleagues, the spine surgeons. Um, but it's amazing to, to see the different types of pain states. Some of the most common diseases in the United States, diabetes, um, diabetic peripheral neuropathy is a huge burden just by means of us having such a high degree of diabetes in, this United, in the United States. So I see a lot of that. Some we can help more predictably, others we kind of have to chip away at it and mm -hmm. we rely on the medical therapies, uh, which nobody likes taking medicines, but unfortunately sometimes we don't have a lot of other things to offer. I don't like taking medicines and I won't, don't like my family members to take medicines, but um, sometimes we don't have much else to offer. Mm -hmm. So when a person comes into your office, uh, what's the first thing you do then? Do you spend some time I getting sit down analytical and data, just anecdotally to see what, what's happening? Yeah, we, it's important to just hear somebody's story. You know, you have, to, you have to talk to people. And a lot of times you'll pick up on small things that may not have seemed relevant before. But it's, impor it's important to me to mean, there has to be a personalized component of medicine still. You know, we're, we're busy in the world of medicine. Um, we try to see, get as many people in the door as we can so they have access to us, and that is a double-edged sword because the busier you get, potential for the, le the less access you have for people. But, so we work in teams, uh, and what I mean by that is we have nurse practitioners and PAs and um, kind of advanced practice providers and wonderful nurses that all help us build a system where they have access to the physicians but the physicians have help and support. And so it's, it's my philosophy that I try my best to see every new patient that comes in um, as long as I'm in town. But that's my personal philosophy because if somebody comes to see me, I feel like they should have a conversation with me. And then we come up with a plan. Um, I always use the analogy. It's kind of, you're, in a way, you're selling something. You're, you're offering your plan and your services to somebody. By no way are they committed to, to your ideas. Um, every physician, just like different mechanics, they may have different ideas on how to fix the same problem. Um, and so you should have the ability to say yes or no. And so they come in, we sit down, we talk, uh, you learn about the person. Because some people, just by way of their experiences in life, they may, the disease may suggest a therapy like an injection, but the person may not be amenable to that, may mm -hmm. want to do that. So people are people and you got to get to know, the, you have to get to know each individual person. What do you find the most frustrating thing about your specialty? Oh boy. <laughs> um, Putting you on you the know, spot. that's a great question. There's a lot of frustrations. Um, you know, we work real hard in medicine today to um, be good team players with the insurance systems and things and we, we have a lot of great benefits in this country with regards to our medical care. Sometimes when things just aren't working, you know, and you have to be honest with people and say that sometimes we try things and they just don't work. And that's frustrating for me and it's frustrating for the, for the patients because sometimes you have to reach that point where you say, I don't really know what else to do or I don't have anything else to offer. We, we need to go somewhere else and we need to find something else. With all the national debate about uh, prescription drugs. Yes. Are you seeing a change in the medical community about, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of times where that they've used all their options and there aren't other options. That's you know, right. I mean, there are, I've, I've known people who have been in severe accidents and <laughs> you can do all the therapy you want to, it isn't going to help them. But do you see that with because of the political pressure in the news media, do you see a change or? There's a big change. Is there? Um, there's a big <clears throat> change. And, you know, I think... There's two different perspectives on this. I come into it from the, the new and recent perspective, so I think I have an advantage because I don't have a history of being at a different place in time where we didn't have the government influence pushing us one direction. Right now, and it goes back to the evidence of things in the research, what we've learned over the last 20, 30 years is some of the things we've been doing may not have been as helpful to people as we thought they would be. And when we say helpful, what we look at is over time we say, does it change the person for the better? Does it improve their quality of life? And then we always have to ask the question, is it doing any harm for them? And with some of the things we do with regards specifically to opioids, in some instances, over the long term, <clears throat> 
we've found that unfortunately we've probably been hurting a lot of people unintentionally um, with good intentions originally, but mm -hmm. we now have the evidence, which we didn't have, we have hindsight. We didn't have hindsight 20 years ago. We, we found a good product with regards to the opioids that worked well, but we didn't know what the effect they would have in 20 years. So I say I have a different perspective because I come out now in a world where we have the support of the government and these national institutions to limit the, prescrip the prescribing of some of these medicines to people if they're not appropriate. And there's a lot of pressure from the, these regulatory agencies to monitor people and to keep doses lower than perhaps we had in the past. And so if somebody, in my opinion, if they have are improving in their quality of life, their function is maintaining, we have to look at that in context to the person. But we also have to ask, are we really doing you a disservice in the long run? And um, that's a hard question to answer yeah. sometimes. I can imagine, especially in your field, where you're dealing with so much abstract information. It is, and to give credit, <clears throat> probably the, the ones that bear the brunt force of it are, you know, everybody has access primarily to a primary care physician or a family doctor or provider. And they deal with that probably more than I do just by way, way of access in this country. And so they come to me perhaps for, for help in a consultation on opioid management or whether this person is appropriate or not. Um, and I don't think they get the credit of the challenge that, they, that they're seeing. And because they're dealing with, I deal specifically with pain. They're dealing with pain and diabetes and sure. heart disease and blood pressure. So I try to support them, but my main goal really is, and a lot of people don't like this, but my main goal is to not hurt somebody. You know, I don't want to make them better off than they were when they come in. And it's a fright, pain is frightening for people. It is. You know, changing things is frightening. And so we have, that's the emotional context. We have to reassure them that it will be okay and that we're going to take them in a good direction, but it may be difficult. We're out of time. Okay. But it's a fascinating topic, and uh, you can be reached through the Cuyuna Regional Medical Center. Yes, I can. In Crosby. We have a wonderful website. Uh, you can call the hospital, and um, really, you can arrange a referral through your family provider. You can just come see us, give us a phone call, but we welcome everybody. Thank you very much. Welcome Thanks to the area. Me. You bet. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow. So long until next time.